when we look at Ephesians, we see a theme running through this, this whole book, kind of like a, a golden thread, um, just something that God is speaking through this book to this particular church, but it also applies to us today. And when we look into the book of Ephesians, um, the first thing that we see is that there's great teaching about the riches that we possess as believers in Jesus Christ. We have these great riches that God gives us. And, and next, it lays out foundational beliefs, principles, and, and, and practical applications for all believers to live by. And, and it also encourages, um, then it encourages the, the unity that God desires to see within his church um, so that the church can be effective in the world that uh, we're in. And um, it's a dark world out there, isn't it? Ephesians finishes off um, speaking about spiritual warfare. So um, we know that the enemy, he just does not want the church to be effective and productive out there. He desires to hold people captive, and the church is a threat. And uh, in the final chapter here, um, we see that Paul just sort of finishes up. Now, you guys probably knew this, but in the original language, um, there's not chapters and verses. It's a letter. So there's been divisions made by people uh, way back when, and, and it helps us reference everything. But this is meant to be looked at as a letter. And sometimes, sometimes we, um, when we read a letter and we, we pick scriptures out of a book, um, we forget that there is a context, an overriding, an overarching uh, context for what is being spoken about. And Paul ties in the themes of his letter to the Ephesians in this final chapter. He kind of, he kind of ends with his discussion upon unity, and there's no accident that um, the, the discussion with with the people on unity, the importance of unity leads into a, a, a discussion about spiritual warfare and effectively um, fighting what comes against us. And, and so this morning, um, there is much to be said about closeness in relationships with one another and, and the effectiveness of the church in the overall plan of God and society. Now, God desires us to have unity. He really does. It's so important. And the devil, your adversary, and the demons that are with him, they want nothing more than to disrupt that unity. Because he knows that if he can disrupt that unity, it's going to cause trouble with the church in being effective in their witness for the gospel on the street. So there's nothing more brutal to a Christian mission than division. Nothing more brutal. He is a mastermind, or the enemy is a mastermind at causing division. You guys have seen this, right? We've seen it on a family level. We've seen it in, on our marriages, right? In our relationships with our children, in extended family relationships. We see it in, in, in workplaces, and, and, and also we see it in the church. You know, there is, there is a force working against the believer, and we need to be aware of this. And that, that force of darkness wants to see unity destroyed, disrupted and destroyed. So, the good news is this morning that God has not left us alone to fight the battles. Amen? Jesus certainly is king. That song that we sung, you know, in the beginning of the service. Satan is vanquished and Jesus is king. 
God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. He's given us everything to stand against our foe in victory. So this morning, would you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6? And we're going to be speaking about, uh, first of all, this, the last few things that Paul de- desires to impart to us regarding unity and relationships. So Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 1, Paul says this. He says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and so that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, when you look out there, the world is filled with disobedience. And we certainly don't need to teach our children to disobey, do we? <laughs> it's not something that's taught. Because each, children, each child has this inherited inclination to disobey, and that's been passed down from Adam. You and I, as children, had the same propensity. Obedience, however, is another matter, isn't it? Obedience must be taught. And it's absolutely essential for believing parents to teach their children obedience so that they will know up knowing how to obey God. And the challenge of that is that teaching obedience needs to be done even when those children that we're teaching don't understand the big picture. Or, despite knowing the big picture, they don't want to. No, I don't want to. I don't want to listen. So we have this this challenge, don't we, as parents? That's not a natural inclination for human beings to be obedient. It just isn't. So, when we see disobedience at work in our families with our children, we need to deal with it. There needs to be some consequences, and we must punish disobedience out of love for them so that um, obedience can be learned because we know that over the long term, that's going to help them establish their lives in a way that's honoring and pleasing to God. Now, but there's more. Now, if you're, you're a kid here today or a teen or a youth, or, you know, that nature in you from Adam, when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you ask him to be your savior, God breaks the chains of sin around your heart. Every human being that submits to Jesus Christ, he breaks those chains so sin no longer is your master. It doesn't need to be your master. You don't have to yield to that desire of the nature of Adam that's within you. You don't have to yield to that nature to be disobedient and rebellious. You don't have to. Sin is no longer your master, for you're not under law, but under grace. God's given you grace as a young person. He's given you grace to stand and to do what is right. And you see, there's this common misconception in the adult community sometimes that, that's completely wrong. And that is this. The children really don't have the capacity to go deep with God. And, and I know not everybody thinks this, but there's kind of an overarching, like, sometimes you see it where children aren't counted as part of the church almost, where they're just kind of a byproduct. They're, they're there to see, be seen and not heard. And This is very disturbing. Jesus said, let the little children come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Unless we have faith like that of a little child, we won't even see the kingdom of God. There's a big place in God's heart for kids. And kids, I want you to hear this and hear it. Clearly, the Spirit of God desires for you 
to be completely submitted to him. And a child can come to know Christ at a very young age. I remember the day I gave my life to Jesus when I was four years old. I remember it as clear as I'm looking at you right now. God's given me that, that gift where I can remember sitting on my mother's knee and I can remember giving my heart to Jesus at age four. And, and, and children, you don't have to wait till you're an adult to take the word of God seriously and allow the Lord to, 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 to work in and through you. The love of God is real. And, and when you open your heart to the love of God, His Spirit shines in you. And not only does it shine in you, but it shines out of you. So when Paul is saying to the children here, obey your parents for this is in, of, of the Lord, your rebellious nature is going to go, eh, I don't want to, or whatever. I don't think I want to, or maybe you even have learned to manipulate around things to get what you want without actually submitting to your parents. But, but God wants you to open your heart to him and allow his love to fill you so that when you're interacting not only with your parents but the other kids in your family and the, the people outside of your family, the love of Christ will beam forth like a light shining in the darkness. You can be as much of an example of faith, of love, and of purity as any adult and even more so, because God has made you who you are. And there's a special place for you even as a child. The world has its way of chipping away at people. Well, I, I encourage you this morning. If you haven't given yourself to Christ, you need to do that. And when you do it, God will help you to be the person that he's designed you to be. And who he's designed you to be is beautiful. It's wonderful. And it's dynamic. It's not boring. To be God's child and to do God's work is absolutely fantastic. There is so much life in Jesus. Anyways, but there's more. See, we are all children of God, aren't we? And our motivation to obey God must develop more than just cause and, but through cause and effect, through punishment and reward. He doesn't want us just to be good and to obey and to submit to him out of punishment and reward just because if we don't, bad things will happen. If we do, good things will happen. No. He wants us to respond out of love. And the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, when you ask Jesus to be your Savior, makes his residence inside of your spirit. And there's light. And there's love of God there. Let, it, let, let, God, let God use you and, and, and help you to love other people that God puts in your life the way that God loved you. And that means, that includes your mom and dad. Let God Love your mom and dad through you. May you be a conduit for the love of God to your parents. And part of that is, is making sure that you respect them and love them. Well, what if your parent is hurtful? What if your parent has made terrible decisions and have hurt both you and members of your family and maybe you live in a home where things are rough or have lived in a home where things are rough? Love for a hurtful parent it certainly doesn't come from our own abilities. It's not something we can do. I talked with someone recently who all their lives is a senior. All their lives they haven't been able to forgive their father. But once that forgiveness comes, there's freedom. See, the love of Jesus is supernatural. And it can help you to overcome the wounds of your past, of the things that have been done to you. It comes from the supernatural love of Jesus who died for us even while we were undeserving sinners. See, that's the love of God for you. We don't deserve to be receiving God's grace and love. 
But he gives it to us nonetheless. And as, as, as people, God desires us to have the same attitude as Christ. And that means allowing forgiveness to flow. If you need to forgive your parents for something they've done to you, you need to do it. Why? Because God forgave you and loved you even while you were a sinner. Therefore, we ought to love one another and forgive one another just as he loved us. And when you do that, there's something that happens inside of you that frees you, that sets you free. Because no longer is, it, is, love, is love measured on receiving its, all, its, 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 its own life within you. God, God desires us to love him and to love others despite what's happening around us, whether the world's crashing down, whether terrible things happen around us or to, to us. He wants us to learn contentment in him in any circumstance, regardless of what happens. God desires us to be the same when things are awesome and the same when things aren't going so well. Why? Because he's faithful and he'll take you through the valleys and he'll, he'll, he'll give you joy through the mountains when you're on the mountaintops. See, sometimes we, our faith ends up resting on our feelings rather than the unshakable character, character of Christ. Our faith ought not to rest on our feelings but on the unshakable character of Christ and his unshakable character is that he loves us. That's the primary character trait of God, of God, is that he loves us. And he also wants us to submit to that. Fathers, Paul says here, not to exasperate your children. And according to the definition of exasperation, um, when someone exasperates another, that someone is brought to a feeling of intense irritation and annoyance. Fathers, we generally have a more robust physical presence, don't we? We also have testosterone coursing through our veins, which makes us naturally more domineering and aggressive, just naturally. Knowing these facts, fathers, means that we need to keep our natural propensities to dominate in check. When we yield ourselves to the Spirit, the love of the Father gives us His mind and His demeanor. And the love of the, of the Father is demonstrated in definition in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy does not boast, is not proud, doesn't seek self, it doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. All these things that 1 Corinthians 13 says about love. When we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit, the love of the Father gives us His mind and His demeanor. And we need to walk in that. Self-control means when your propensity to be aggressive and to be domineering due to your testosterone, that we need to be self-controlled and say, okay, this, I could do this, and as a father, I, you know, I've gone this path. I'm the domineering kind of person that makes my kids kind of go, oh, stay out of the way. You have too if you're a dad, <laughs> likely, unless maybe you've never had a problem with this. Most guys tend to struggle with this sometimes especially when things irritate us, right? It's easier for us to throw our weight around and just kind of make them th know who's in control. Right? Throw our weight around here. Pa fathers, Paul says here, don't exasperate your children. But uh, instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So that means setting aside the old man, saying, Lord, I love you and I love the people that are around me. I submit to your authority over me, God, and I choose to love. And the Spirit, when we yield to the teachings and the Word of God, the Spirit gives us strength to be 
fulfilling what is written there. And it's not, you, you might not be able to do it on your own steam, right? You can't. For sure you can't. You might be able to fool it for a while, fool things for a while, but sooner or later, if you're trying to do it yourself, you're going to fall flat on your nose and you're going to hurt people around you. Okay. So relationships. You see how this is tied into unity and relationships? Fathers, if you're showing love to your children, um, then they in turn will have this relationship with you that is wholesome. Children, if you respect and honor your parents, moms and dads, that's going to bring this relationship of unity. And this, this, this is important for your family, but it's also important for God's kingdom, for the church, because your family, if you're Christians, your family is part of the church. The church isn't the building, it's you. You're part of the church. So it has a, a, an impact on our witness out there in the community for the gospel. Okay, so we move on. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. The whole sermon on you now, this particular passage, I could speak a whole sermon on slavery and, and all that itself. Like I could go into this, and, but we're going to stick to what I think Paul is trying to get across here. Um, there is definitely a topic that could expand into a series of messages on this. But, um, you know, we know that in our society now, at least in our culture, there's no more slavery as we've seen in the past. Um, in the past, people would either be taken against their will and become a slave to someone, or they would actually sell themselves into slavery because they couldn't afford to feed their families and, and to pay for a living for their family, they would sell themselves as a slave to, to a rich person because they were underprivileged. Today, we don't see that the same way. And in, in our society, in the place of a slavery system, we have developed a system where people sign on the dotted line and they sign on to work as an employee for an employer. And the employer gives them a wage in exchange for their labor. So Paul's encouraging believers, I believe, what he's saying here, who find themselves in a subservient position, a servanthood position, in our, in our case, as an employee. And, and those believers also who find themselves in management positions or as bosses to fulfill their duties as believers in reverence towards the other party. Now, what, what Paul is teaching here is that Christian employees and employers are both, are both being instructed here to follow the golden rule. And for those of you who don't know what the golden rule is, the golden rule is the principle of treating other people as you would want to be treated yourself if you were in their position. So the bottom line of this is this. Out of love and reverence for God and our fellow man, both Christian employees and employers should be the very best examples of employee and employer relationships that there is on the planet. That's the truth. If we're connected to the King of Kings, God's desire is that the church shines. And one of the ways the church shines is the way that we work. The way that we treat other people while we work. Whether we're bosses or whether we're employees. How do we carry ourselves in our attitude towards our work and the people that God has placed in the sphere that he's placed us in? Paul is encouraging this humble, this serving, this giving attitude. And last week we talked about how Jesus, as the servant king, washed the feet of his disciples. Not only does that apply in marital relationships where we serve one another, or in family relationships, or in relationships within the church, but also how we carry ourselves out there. And what happens if you have a jerk for a boss? That's not easy, is it? 
God can give you his mind and his strength so that you can be who God wants you to be in the midst of even times where you are mistreated, where you are maligned, where you are misunderstood. As a boss, maybe you're a manager and you're pulling your hair out because you have these employees that are always doing stuff, right? And the stuff they're doing isn't benefiting your, your uh, goal in the company. How do you treat those people? Well, yeah, there needs to be discipline. But there also needs to be this understanding that they are human beings that have issues. And maybe their issues are surfacing and you need to try and work with that, right? As a Christian employer, God can give you spiritual wisdom. The spiritual gifts are given not only in a public ser service setting. The gifts of God are given to be used anywhere you set your feet because you are the church. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. So when you step out into the public setting, you carry the standard of Christ. Paul is encouraging us to live as children of the light and walk in the light, even as he is in the light. Walk in the light. Now, so, all of this obedience to God and treating one another right has to be for the right reasons, right? It's not like you're going to earn brownie points with God by doing this or that or the other thing in works. Your salvation is not dependent upon works. It's by grace. But the, if grace takes root in your heart and you understand the love of God and the forgiveness that he's given you, out of that thankfulness and that gratefulness comes a love for him and that love for him permeates you and causes you to love others like he loves you. It just, this it, at one minute, the atonement is meant to bring us together with God where once we were far apart from God, now we're brought together. And once we're brought together with God, the spirit of the living God who lives within you desires the things that God desires. That's how behavior is changed. It's not from me saying, I'm going to pull my own weight here and I'm going to do it. I'm going to. I'm No. What we need to say is, I choose, Lord, to submit to you because I know that without you, I don't have the strength to be the person that you would want me to be. And I want to please you because I love you. So please help me. Help me to walk in a way that's honoring to you. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of my message, our adversary, Satan, is a liar and he's always on the hunt to try and resist God and his kingdom. If Satan can influence people to give in to their sin impulses, and live in disobedience, he will. True Christians in particular, Satan's not afraid of religious people. People that are trying to earn brownie points with their religion. He's not concerned at all about those people. As a matter of fact, they're playing into his hand. But true Christians, particularly, are a threat to him. We are a threat to him. We're a threat, and you know what? Satan is terrified of the blood-bought saints of Christ who are following the commands of their chief. He's terrified of that because he knows that there is authority that's been given to the church to trample on him. You see, when Peter and the disciples were standing in Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. The gates of hell will not prevail. They're looking at the, the cave probably in, the, in, in Caesarea Philippi where Pan was worshipped, the, the entrance point, that they, or the god that, that uh, dealt with the underworld, and that was kind of the entrance point that they saw. It was an entrance point for spirits to come back and forth into the world. And when Jesus was saying, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. He was referring to this spiritual gateway. And, and not saying that there's a literal gate into the mountain. No, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is that Satan holds people captive in this world behind these walls, behind these fortresses, 
and there's gateways into those fortresses, you are put in the world and you are shown these gateways to enter into the lives of the people that are around you in the world around you. There's Every one of us has relationships with people outside of the church. There's these gateways where the influence of the gospel can come into their lives to set them free. The Bible says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. That means you are on the offensive and hell is on the defensive. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not like the gates of hell are coming against us and we've got to shrink back. Oh, no, no, no. The gates of hell are coming against us. No, we are going against the gates of hell. And those gates of hell that keep people captive are, are in threat of falling as the church of Christ advances. So, spiritual enemies hate the church. The devil hates the church. Evil detests seeing the strength of God's people living our lives collectively and effectively in unity, obeying what God has called us to be and what God has called us to do. They hate it because they lose souls to the true church of Christ that's advancing. And they're, dis- they're bent on destruction. The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and might have life to the full, or abundant life, abundantly. Saints, it's important for us to understand that your enemy wants to uproot the blessings of God over your lives, over the, the people of God, and we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness. When you have a week and it seems like everything's coming against you, pay attention. It means that you might be pressing against the gate. God wants you to do something or be there for someone that needs freedom. Then when you get resistance, you can almost guarantee that there's someone that's around you that God's placed you in proximity to that you're, you're poking the bear. Finally, be strong in the Lord, says Paul. And this is on the cusp of his talk on unity, remember? He says, finally, be strong in his mighty power. When you, want, when you fight spiritual forces against you, you are like this, in humility, calling out on God, saying, God, have mercy. Give me wisdom, Lord. I don't know how I can stand Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our wrestle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our spiritual enemies are going to try and throw us. They're going to try and sow discord amongst us. They're going to try and divide us. Because it's divide and conquer. They try to use people who are not walking closely with their God to further their end to divide and conquer. The church, we are God's representatives. He's chosen us to walk with Him and to bear the gospel in partnership with Him. He has chose to make us a living temple. So he lives inside of us and he works in us and he works through us. We're the light of the world. A city on a hill that cannot be hidden. The salt of the earth. These these, uh, illustrations are meant to show us the unity that we have with Christ and that we're his ambassadors. And when we speak, it's not that we're just speaking our own words. It's as though Christ is speaking through us. So when you share the gospel with people In your sphere, God speaks through you. He doesn't need us, but he chooses to invite us to participate with him in that work. It's beautiful. What's our inheritance in this land? Our inheritance, I think we can say, first and foremost, is our freedom to worship God. Right? We're set free so that we can worship Him. Everything else flows from our connection to the Lord. And that's why 
the first and most important commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What else is our inheritance? It's the people of the caribou. The people that we're connected to in our families or in other communities where we have these connections. God desires us to be light and salt amongst those people because he desires that they be saved and delivered and healed. And you are Christ's ambassadors, so you're part of his army going forward. He's asked us us to participate with him. Our enemy is bent on keeping that from happening. Don't be afraid, church. When you come against resistance, and you will, if you're serving God, you will come against resistance. Don't be afraid. Jesus told his disciples in Luke 10, 19, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome not just some, but all of the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Is it talking about physical? No, it's not talking about physical. All the apostles except for one lost their lives for the sake of the gospel. So it's not talking about physical harm. It's saying that you cannot be separated from the love of God no matter what happens. God will shine through you. Just like Stephen, when the stones were raining down upon him as they were martyring him, God gave him a gift to see. He says, look, I see. I see Jesus. You know, he's saying this. And what is this? What is his thought in the midst of the raining stones that were coming down upon him and the pain that was searing him? He says, Father, don't hold this sin against them. How could he say that? Stones are crashing against his skull. The pain is, is searing. He says it because the spirit of the living God lives in him. And he speaks the love of God on the people that are hurting him. Why? Because he understands the big picture. God wants us to understand the big picture. God wants you to understand the big picture where he's placed you. Don't worry. Nothing will harm you. No matter what happens in this body, nothing will harm you. Cast your cares upon him for he cares for you. We're not on our own, are we? Paul tells the believers in another passage when he's writing to the Corinthians, he says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5, for, for though we live in the world, we don't wage, world as, or wage war as the world does. So although we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have the divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought and make it captive Every, we take every captive, every thought, to make it obedient to Christ. So, Paul makes it very clear that the war he's talking about is a spiritual war. And we don't fight spiritual wars the same way we fight physical wars with weapons such as swords, spears, or clubs, or guns, or whatever we have at our disposal in the physical. That's not how we fight the wars that we face as believers. The troubles we face in our lives manifest in the physical, for sure. But our true enemies are not the people. Our true enemies are not the systems established by people. Our true enemies are principalities and powers of darkness and high places. Now, I've seen this, and you probably have seen it too, because it's all over the place. So many messengers of the gospel have been sidetracked from the true war which is waging in the spiritual realms. And instead of seeing the battle outside of the physical realm, they focus their attention on the struggles within the realm of the flesh. Ministers pursuing this focus are leading people to expend energies on mere human issues, asking people to stand up and fight in the physical. I'm not saying we don't stand up for what's right, but there comes a point where we have to let go and let God deal with what God deals with. It doesn't mean that we don't say anything. It just means it changes the way that we perceive our position as a church. It involves um, 
us coming to terms with who we are in Christ and the spiritual armor that he's given us to fight. So if he's asked us to fight in the spiritual realm, we should be paying attention to what we're going to read next in Ephesians. God's given us heavenly armor, the armor of light. And it's not typical armor. It's not like the armor the, the crusaders put on in the name of Christ. No. He continues saying, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, which with you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So, the first thing we see here is soldiers of Christ in your spiritual battle, God wants you to stand firm. When the tide of evil comes against you, you can get easily discouraged, can't you? I know I can, and I have been. But God says stand firm. Stand firm on the promises in his word. He's promised that you're not alone. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. He's not going to let you fight the dragons that are trying to get at you alone. So stand firm. Trust in the Lord and look at him. God's desire is that we stand firm, not turn, face, and run. All the spiritual armor that you see here, you know one thing it's got in common? It's all front-facing. It's all front-facing. Your defensive armor included is front-facing, which means what the illustration here of this particular uh, scripture means that you are called to stand firm and advance, and God has given you the provisions to do so. No weapon formed against you as a saint of Christ will prosper. That is a promise in the word of God, so stand firm. When you're coming into a battle scenario, don't back away. Don't run. Don't tuck tail and run. I know it's easy for us to r kind of drift to that where we just want to hide somewhere. Self-preservation, self-protection, we run from the battle and we hide. We hold up on the hill somewhere. We become spiritual hermits. No, God doesn't want you to become a spiritual hermit, my friend. He wants you to stand firm and he wants you to advance for the sake of the gospel. This is a universal principle. Where does that come from? Isaiah chapter 54, 17. When it comes to facing spiritual battles, this was originally given to the Israelites, but it applies to us. You'll see in the, in the scripture it says, no weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me. Are you a servant of Christ? If you're bought by the blood of Jesus, you are a saint because of the work of Christ, because his righteousness is robed upon you. You wear his righteousness. You're a child of the king. Don't ever forget it. Don't know that everyone, just because you struggle with sin, don't forget that in your struggle, you are a saint of Christ because of the work that God has wrought on your behalf. It's not things that I am responsible for. I can't earn my salvation, but I stand in the power of God because his righteousness has been clothed. I've been clothed in his righteousness. So, when the weapons are forged against you, what does the scripture say here? They will not prevail. This is a promise. You will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. This promise was made 2,700 plus years ago. And it's applying, it applies directly to you and I in, in this assembly here today. So, when we're attacked, we have been given the helmet of salvation. It protects our minds. God gives us a new life, and he gives us protection over that new life. The devil wants to wound us, penetrate our mind with his lies, with his fiery lies. There's a lot of lies out there, and he wants to wants to attack your mind. You've been given the, the helmet of salvation. That's protection against the fiery darts of the evil one. Now, when you think about the, the armor, okay, soldiers just don't go running 
in those days, in the Roman soldier days, okay, they don't just go running around going, see, I got armor on my head, go ahead, take your shot. Right? Look it, I got salvation, take a shot, devil, go ahead, take a shot. You're not going to get through? Now, that's not how they operate, is it? God's given us a shield of faith. The shield is meant to intercept the fiery darts, trusting in God. The shield of faith. A blessed breastplate of righteousness. When the arrows somehow, sometimes our faith is weak, isn't it? Sometimes we need to ask God, Lord God, help me. I know I only have this measure of faith. I don't have more. Increase me, my faith, Lord. Help me. Help me believe. Help me. Sometimes we're like Thomas, aren't we? In our nature. We, we need this, people. We need to increase our trust. And we can't do that by doing it ourselves. Pray to the Lord to help you to increase your faith so that you trust Him more. This is spiritual growth, and God gives it to us. Now, our feet are shod, or we've got this breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts. God desires that our hearts are pure. The devil longs to penetrate hearts with his lies. Our feet are shod with the gospel of peace, enabling us to move forward and bringing the gospel to the lost in the midst of the fight. The devil wants to take away our peace with his fiery lies so that we will be crippled in going where God has asked us to go with the message. And all that armor that's on your body, it's held together by truth. The Roman armor, the belt held everything in place. What holds your shield? Your, 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 your breastplate and all, and, and, and all that in place, it's, it's, it's truth. The belt of truth is around our waist. It holds us. It keeps the armor in place. You can, truly, you can trust the Lord because His word is true. What is truth? My word is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And His word is truth. He embodies truth. And His word is truth. And we can trust His Word because it is true. And when we trust His Word, our faith rises. We trust in God. You see how it's, it's all interconnected, and it's not something we can work up on our own. Shield of faith is raised to absorb the brunt of the attack. But for the armor to be effective, my believing friends, we must put it on. Put on the full armor of God. You must work in partnership with God. God asks you to put it on. He says, place your trust in me. Right? He says, understand who you are in me. Understand who you are. Know that I will never leave you or forsake you, but I'll be with you to the very end of the age. All of this works in tandem with the Holy Spirit in us, working with us. We can't do this on our own. You can't stand against the enemy on your own strength. So, the Word of God. The Word of God is the sword of the Lord. The sword of the Spirit that you wield, that you wield, is your only offensive weapon. The Word of God is your offensive weapon. And he gives it to you to wield, but it is not your word. It is his word. It is the sword of the Spirit. It belongs to the Spirit. He gives you the privilege of wielding it, but it is the power of God that makes the word come to life. When you speak the word of God in the power of God, the enemy is scattered. He runs. He's defeated because the word is power. And there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in His words. There's power in the truth that comes from His word. It's all connected. It's all interconnected. Do you see it? Can you feel it? Yes. You are a soldier of the light. Step forward in faith. Trust in the Lord and use His word. What did Jesus say when the devil came against Him? The, it is written. It is written. It is written. That's how He defends His position and attacks the, the lies. But it's not done there. 
And then Paul says in verses 18 to 20, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. You know what? The reason why God uses the Roman army in this particular context is the way they fought. <laughs> they linked shields. Their shields were together. They became an imper impenetrable barrier as the army walked forward. The shields covered the guy beside them, and the guy beside them covered you, and there were shields overhead, and there were shields beside. There were shields all on the front face. Why? Because God designed you not to walk solo. He, walked, he designed you to walk together with him and the other believers. We are all one in Christ. This is why unity is so important. As we walk forward, God grants us victory. And we protect each other. We cover each other. I'm not saying we cover each other's sin. We cover each other when we need one another. Because sometimes you're going to get hit because of something. You're going to get hit and you're going to need the person next to you, the person in the family of God to encourage you. We have a twofold purpose coming to church, friends, and it's not so that we can receive. We come to church to give. We come to church to serve, and in serving and in giving, we end up receiving. I don't come to church to get blessed. I come to church to gather with God's people to bless Him and to bless you because you are His children. And God wants all of his kids to come with that mentality. So we come to serve and we come to bless and we come to give. And in giving and blessing and serving, we find that all of our needs are met because everyone's, it's reciprocal. <laughs> so we don't have to worry. Anyways. <sighs> we can't overcome sin. We can't be holy on our own strength. We need Jesus. We need the Spirit and we need each other. That's why God designed things the way he did. He fills us with his spirit, and he makes us part of a body. We cannot, remember how we talked about God made us in his image? The church that is blood-bought, that is submitted to Christ, bears the image of God in the way that he created man to be in his image. When you walk in accordance to obedience, as we're, we're painting here, if you walk in that obedience, you become image bearers. Image bearers of the living God. So this morning I want to encourage you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. <laughs> Absolutely nothing can separate you from His love. Jesus has given us his love. And I want to close with this verse. And I'm just going to read it. In Romans 8, 37 to 39, Paul says this. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Aren't you glad this morning, saints of God, that this is true? <laughs>